Hi, my name is Leo and I'm a boat builder and a sailor and I'm on a mission to rebuild and restore this 110 year old classic sailing yacht Tally Ho. Right now we're working on the deck structure, we've already installed all the king beams so I'm going to be working on installing the carlins which are the four and a half timbers that go around the hatches and Pete's going to start off with installing the last few full width beams and then we're going to be putting in the half beams which go out from the carlins to the beam shelf. Right now. Oh, we're just in the cockpit with a beer, hey dude. <laughs> Pete, what are you up to there? Oh. Just starting to fit the first of the uh, standard beams. They're slightly smaller in dimension, um, but they still span the whole uh, with the boat and we're skipping out doing the dovetails on them because they don't they don't they're not king beams they don't get carlins put into them um, put me on you know what I'm doing here um, <laughs> so uh, yeah pretty much the same process uh, short of the dovetail so it's actually a little bit quicker joint As you can see from the original beam shelf, it was only the king beams that were originally dovetailed into it. The few standard beams and all the half beams were just notched into the beam shelf with a simple lap. There's not a lot of overlap with these beams, so there's really not much point cutting a dovetail. It would be such a small surface area that it wouldn't really be doing very much. Way quicker. Yeah. What's going on down there, Paddy? Oh, hey. Well, I'm just sanding these half beams, aren't I? I got a pair of half beams that are going to go on either side, I think, of the cockpit. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I hope somebody does. <laughs> 31, yeah, they should be the cockpit. That's the cockpit, yeah. So they're gonna go like this, with the cockpit carlins coming this way. I'll be sitting right here, martini in hand. <laughs> So this is one of the original hatches from the boat. More specifically, I would call this the butterfly hatch combing. Um, so there will be a skylight hatch which rests on top of this uh, and can be attached or removed. And then that's what this lip is for. And then this part is attached permanently to the boat. As you can see, it's very worn. It's got a lot of damage, a lot of old fastenings in it and so on. And there's a bit of rot in parts of it as well. But this is teak, and teak is amazingly rock resistant because it's so oily and it tends to last a very long time. So although this looks like it's in a terrible state, I'm actually quite hopeful that underneath this, we might find some good timber. Look at that right there, huh?
we're just trying to strip off the old paint and all the kind of crudded out metal and um, just trying to get a look at the teak underneath the surface of this hundred years of corrosion. That looks pretty nice, huh? Well, the entire hatch hasn't been sanded yet, but the surfaces that have been sanded and taken back actually look really nice underneath. And that's really exciting for me because I'm fairly confident now that we can probably reuse this hatch. Of course, it's gonna need uh, quite a few repairs. There are places where it's damaged, um, so it'll end up having quite a lot of plugs and graving pieces in it. But I feel like that will just add to its character and it'll be really nice to have an original part of the boat right there where everybody can see it. Um, I've just been painting the centre line with the boat soup. It's a mixture of boiled linseed oil, terps and pine tar and it helps to prevent checking on the surface of the timber. There's no need to paint it on the inside of the rabbit because that's going to be carved out some more pretty soon. Getting some of that sweet Patrick footage right now. Oh, you're getting it. That's what the people want, baby. What are you doing there? Yeah, so getting these frames all smooth so that they can take the face of the... <laughs> so they can take the... So that they can take the... Bronze floors, go across here, fit it onto the keel, hold the boat together. What, what do we have to do before we can put the floors in? We gotta make templates. Mm -hmm. So this week I started thinking about floors. After Pete showed him the procedure, Patrick has been fairing the inside of the frames, getting them nice and smooth and fair to accept the new floors which we're going to be making. The floors are the brackets which hold the frames down to the keel timber, so they basically hold the bottom corner of the boat together. Behind me you can see the original floors from Tally Ho, and they were all made out of wrought iron, which has caused a lot of problems as it's corroded and caused a lot of iron rot in the frames. There are many materials and methods of constructing floors and none of them are necessarily right or wrong but in this case I think the best way for me to replicate the original design without using ferrous metal is to cast the floors out of bronze and the first step of that process is to make templates so having fared the inside of the frames Patrick and I started making the first templates and to do that we laminated with glue thin strips of plywood up the inside of the frame and then also glued in a bottom piece and some dowels in the bottom corners those dowels will add a lot of thickness in the corners which we'll need because we're going to cut a channel into the outside corner to let water run from one side of the floor to the other. 
That hole is called a limber hole and it's pretty essential to let water drain down to the lowest part of the boat where it can be pumped out by a bilge pump. Then we add some carb body filler and once everything is set and dry then we can take the floor out of the boat and fare it down to a nice smooth shape. Eventually these will be used as templates to cast the real floors out of solid bronze. It's going to be a very expensive process, uh, mainly because of the cost of raw bronze. But in this case, I think it's the right solution for the boat and the only way to do justice to its history. What are you doing? Uh, making some earrings. Yeah? Yeah. They're not finished. They're made of silver, this silver wire that I just um, soldered, like I made into a circle and soldered together. And then I hammered them into the shape I wanted and sanded and polished them up a bit. Nice, they look really good. Yeah, I would have done them bigger if I'd do it again. So they're like big, massive, dangly hoops, but. I can do some more. You can go, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> No, stay. Hey, stay. Uh, hey, this is Backtrack. He's 11. Um, he uh, he's kind of lounges there and watches the chickens parade by. Um, he's a Sagittarius? He's a, no, he's not a Sagittarius. <laughs> he was born in April. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, he's an old man, he just kind of checks in on everybody and makes sure we're staying busy and getting our, getting our job done, so. Okay, so we've got a bit of an issue here with this carlin. Now I fitted this carlin a couple of days ago and when I was fitting it I did notice um, some discoloration in this end of the carlin, just a streak here of slightly darker wood. I also noticed that when I cut this area uh, there's a very strong smell, a kind of vinegary smell. But I was nearly there so I've continued to fit it, but I was thinking about it that evening. 
Now, a couple of weeks ago, I used some offcuts from this white oak to make a tool handle for a friend. When I was making it, I also noticed that same smell. And funnily enough, he came back to me yesterday with a broken handle. This wood still smells like vinegar. And now I can see that it's also a slightly darker shade similar to the streak here. So the fact that it broke, and more importantly, that it broke so cleanly without any sort of grain retention here, uh, really got me worried. And so I started investigating a bit more. I did some experiments, checking the force required to break this piece, and also broke a piece of normal white oak. And I found that the discolored oak was indeed easier to break, and it broke much more cleanly. I did a bit of research online and I'm not certain, but I think this might be something called bacterial wetwood, which is an infection in the timber. Whatever it is, I don't want it in the boat and so that's why I'm remaking this piece. We've had a really thorough look through all the other beams and luckily this is the only one with any of this discoloration in it. I asked around and I couldn't find anyone who really knows what the deal is with this stuff. Um, I'm definitely not putting any of it in the boat, but I'd still be interested to know more about it. So if any of you guys know what this is, then I'd be really interested to know. Now it's quite normal to have natural defects in timber like this and have to work around them. But of course, it's always a shame to have to waste a piece, especially after you've already put time into it. This white oak timber that I got for building the deck structure uh, cost about $14,000, including getting it here. And so especially when you add the labor of making it on top of that, uh, it's easy to see that each of these beams is worth quite a few hundred dollars. That's a very small price to pay, however, for the peace of mind I'll have when I'm sailing Tally Ho through rough seas, and I'll know that she's strong and she hasn't got a piece like this as part of her structure. I'm cutting a notch into the beam shelf here so that the half beams uh, recess into it. So you're filling all the outboard ends and Pete, what are you doing? Sitting on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am lining out the what you call half beams or spur beams. Uh, on this side of the pond. <laughs> I'm notching them into the carlins with, with, a, half, with a half dovetail half lap, half dovetail uh, joint. Um, and so I'm lining them out of the carlins, lining them out of the beam shelf, um, and then projecting a whole bunch of lines uh, to get the notch right. Um, and uh, yeah, right, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> I just need something to raise this up to the shear. A wedge, perhaps? A wedge might work. Whoa! I'm standing on these 2 by 10 <laughs> And Pete, you reckon you can get rid of that knot in the dovetail there? Uh, perfectly. Actually, both those knots. Whew. That's so, nice. Um, yeah, th those knots will be cut out and turned into the pocket, so... It's almost like the guy that cut that carlin out did that on purpose. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, he even started boring out the notch for me. Hopefully he didn't go too deep, though. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see.
All right, well, that's about it for now. It's been really nice to see the deck structure take shape. We've just got to make a few more small beams right in the bow of the boat. And then, of course, we've got to take this all apart. We've got to prime and bed all the joints, cut all the chamfers, and then fasten everything down. And at that point, we can start to think about taking the cross balls out, which is what I'm standing on now. And that'll be really exciting because we'll see the underside of the deck structure and the space inside the boat. Now, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that the foremost deck opening is actually off the center line slightly. It's off center to starboard. I want to assure you that it's supposed to be like that before anyone panics uh, And I'd also like to know if anyone has figured out why so let me know in the comments for now though Thanks a lot for watching and a massive thank you to everyone who's donated or otherwise supported the Tally Ho project It makes a huge difference and it means I'm able to take the time to make and edit these videos So I really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Cheers